Meow meow. Uh, Onyx the Fortuitous here. I don't know. You may know me as Weird Satanist Guy. Notice me, Senpai. Notice me. Or Weird Arby's Guy. So what if I smell like roast beef? This whole place smells like roast beef. Well, I just launched a Kickstarter to make my very own feature film entitled Onyx the Fortuitous and the Talisman of Souls. It's a horror comedy in the tradition of 80s classics like Fright Night or Gremlins or Ghostbusters starring me as your lead sexy bad boy. So if you want to help make my horror comedy feature dreams come true, then go to onyxthemovie.com and consider backing the film on Kickstarter today. I don't know. Kickstarter's pretty cool. Back in 2018, a couple of my frat brothers and I were partying down in Panama City over spring break. I was a sophomore at the time and I'd already gotten all my initial spring break excitement out of my way the previous year, so myself and my frat bros are mostly just taking it easy. Still partying, sure, but just not nearly as wild or dumb as our first year. Thing is, we can blatantly spot all the freshmen and it was pretty cringe thinking that that was what we looked like just the previous year. Those freshmen became the bane of our lives at some points, showing up and puking right as we're parlaying our way into hanging out with a bunch of hotties, generally making idiots of themselves and causing a bunch of nonsense drama. So at one point, we hook up with these girls from Tennessee who say they're going on a booze cruise and we managed to secure ourselves some invites. It was pretty dope for a while, the music was good, no one was asking for IDs while handing out the beer bottles and after a while we all started jumping into the water for a swim. Granted, I know that drinking and swimming is a really dumb thing to do, but I'm pretty sure it was only confident swimmers that decided to get in, and besides, the whole drinking and swimming thing wasn't even the danger. Because in the distance, we can see these jet skis approaching, and as they pull up, we can basically tell that these kids are either straight freshmen or just incredibly dumb. They're asking to party with us, but... The boat is at capacity and then they ask for some beers and they're turned down. They seem to take this on the chin at first but after a while they start turning nasty, hurling insults, revving their jet skis past us. It gets to the point that they're like swooping past us getting closer and closer to the people swimming in the water. We're calling out to them, warning them that they're slowly getting near to colliding with one of our swimmers but I think the engines of the jet skis were just too loud for them to hear. It gets to the point where people are climbing back onto the boat because they just don't feel safe and the captain is talking about calling the cops on these guys because they're obviously drunk and just came out to cause trouble. Then there's literally only one more person in the water when one of these absolute idiots on the jet skis makes one last pass super fast and super close to the boat. You heard the impact of his jet skis smashing into the girl when he hit her, like this big hollow dump noise and the screaming started this kid is panicking and he's revving his engine trying to turn away from the boat he only barely avoided colliding with then one of his revs catches something in the water there's this horrible mechanical crunching sound and then the water around his back end just starts turning red people are seriously panicking by this point but when this poor girl's body floats to the surface and people see how the propeller blades of that jet ski had made mincemeat out of her head. People straight freaked. If I thought the screams were bad before, these new screams made the others sound like a choir of angels. Even the guys joined in, just absolutely horrified by what they saw. People are running to the other side of the boat to puke. One of the girl's friends is just absolutely inconsolable, wailing like a banshee while the people around her just don't know what to do. About an hour later, the place is just a small fleet of cops on boats and EMTs on boats. I mean, it was real bad. People were just in shock, giving statements to the cops, telling them about the kids on the jet skis who, by that time, were long gone. When we finally got back onto dry land, no one was in the mood to party. We just found a senior that could buy us some beers, then just sat there in one of her hotel rooms, trying to process what we'd just been witness to. One of my brothers said that he's been flirting with her like minutes before everyone decided to jump in the water. 
About a half hour later, she was dead, and she died in one of the most horrific ways imaginable. We managed one more day down in Panama City before we decided to throw in the towel and drive back to Tuscaloosa. I remember hearing that Tori Lanez song that mentions jet skis in a bar the next day and thinking it was like a sick cosmic joke. And that's when you know you just need to go home. But yeah, be safe on the water people. It ain't no joke out there. Back in my freshman year of college, me and a few buddies thought that it would be a good idea to drive down to Fort Lauderdale for spring break. Florida was awesome, and I guess all the stress of transitioning to college meant we needed to blow off a little steam, because we partied our balls off for a few days and eventually met up with the dude who hooks us up with something a little stronger than Corona. He asked us what we wanted, and we're just young and dumb and excitable, so we're like, Whatever you got, bro, lay it on us. So, one of my buddies is talking to this dude, and we're just messing around on the beach and sharking some beers from some unwary seniors. And he calls over like, you guys want to try some X? And we're like, yeah, sure, let's try it. We buy a tab each and down it with a little beer, and then the guy starts telling us how he has this stuff called GHB for sale. Now, I didn't notice at the time, but... GHB was pretty popular in the southern states, and it stands for gamma-hydroxybutyric acid. Try saying that ten times fast. Some places register it as an anesthetic, it's so strong, and this guy was just selling it out of the trunk of his car. But that's what you get when you spring break in Florida, I guess. Anyways, the way the dude sold it was like, Yeah man, your body, like, naturally produces this stuff, it's totally natural, and... It'll get you way messed up. We're just out of our minds at this point and in no fit state to make rational decisions, but even in that state of mind, I wasn't all that keen on buying some weird drug I've never heard of from some guy's trunk. Only, here's where the problem comes in. I'm not exactly a little guy. I'm 6'1", I played right guard on my high school football team, so a half hour after I swallowed that tab, I wasn't feeling a freaking thing. So I confront the dealer, complaining that he sold me a dud, and this guy's no gangster, so he offers me a free dose of GHB instead, telling me that it will mess me up, all this other stuff. He opens up his trunk, and there's this gallon jug of what I guess was GHB. He's telling me to take a shot from the bottle cap and goes around front to get some from the glove box or something. So I do as he says, take a shot of this weird salty concoction from this gallon jug's cap, Next thing I know, the dude is looking at me with this horrified look on his face. I'm already feeling the effects of this stuff as he's looking at me. Turns out, good GHB hits you really hard. But I'm like, what dude? He then reaches into his trunk and pulls out a much, much smaller water bottle, like an 18 ounce bottle, and tells me, that's the bottle I should have shot from. Picture it. Little water bottle cap... That's maybe half a shot of whiskey in there, but a gallon jug has like two doubles, and that's how much GHB I drank in one go. So there's me, having done something that had an actual drug dealer scared, and I'm like, I've taken way too much of this, haven't I? This is on top of the fact that GHB mixed with alcohol can potentially be fatal, but for a while there, I felt great. Like it sounds messed up, I know, but there was maybe 10 or 15 minutes where I was just flying high. I walk back over to my friends. We walk off in search of more beer and more girls, and boom. That's all I can remember from that day. The next memory I have after that is bright lights. I'm peeling my eyes open and wondering where I am, and all I can see is bright white lights. And they were the lights on the ceiling of my room in the hospital. I can't move. I can't talk. All I can do is just move my eyes to look down and see all these tubes coming out of my mouth, like trailing down my chest. Before I can think another thing, this nurse appears and tells me not to worry, that I'm in the emergency room, having just woken up from a medically induced coma, because I overdosed. The first thing that runs through my mind is how mad my mom and dad are going to be. 
like I seriously could have died and that's one of my first actual thoughts after waking up. Not how lucky I was to be alive, not how dumb I'd been to mess around with GHB, just I wonder what mom and dad are going to think. But in the end, I think they were just relieved I was okay. I knew how dumb and irresponsible I'd been. I didn't need some lecture or punishment. A brush with death was punishment enough, but it's weird because aside from that initial uh uh-oh moment, I wasn't scared. I was too messed up to be scared and by the time I woke up, the danger was over. It's something that gives me chills when I look back on it. How I look at everything I have now, everything I've earned, and realize I only have it by the grace of God. Mark James Kilroy was born in Chicago on March 5, 1968, the eldest son of Jim and Helen, who were employed as a chemical engineer and a volunteer paramedic. Not long after he was born, his family moved down to Texas, and Mark spent most of his childhood living in a small town called Santa Fe, not far from Houston. As he grew into his teenage years, Mark proved to be that rare breed of person that excels in both athletics and academia leading him to earn a basketball scholarship from a Texas State University. By all accounts, Mark was such a talented basketball player that there's a chance he could have turned pro, but he was also a mature and practical young man, and in 1989, he opted for a transfer to the University of Texas at Austin to become a pre-med student in preparation for his medical college admission test. Mark's parents had instilled a strong work ethic in their son, and there's no doubt that Mark worked his butt off to earn his shot at medical school. But all work and no play make Jack a dull boy, and by spring break of 1989, Mark was about ready to let off a little steam. He and a few college buddies hatched a plan to drive down to South Padre Island for seven days of sun and surf. The trip seemed like it would be a whole world of fun, but for one of them, Spring break would bring a truly harrowing and deeply disturbing ordeal that remains ingrained on the minds of all who hear it. This is the story of the Santa Elena Death Cult. On March 10th, 1989, a friend of Mark's drove over to Austin to pick him up for their trip. They made a brief stop in Santa Fe to pick up two other friends, then hit the road for the nine-hour drive down to South Texas, arriving at the Sheraton Hotel just before midnight. The following morning, they awoke to a college kid's fantasy come to life. Beer sponsors were staging a variety of entertainment events, including free movies, music concerts, free calls home, surf simulator activities, and opportunities to appear on TV commercials. There was even a daily Miss Tan Line contest down at the beach. But most importantly, there were college girls, and given that Mark was raised Catholic, The idea of cavorting with the opposite gender filled him with a rebellious excitement. A few nights later, Mark and his friends were having dinner at a sonic drive-in in nearby Port Isabel. It was there that they met a group of college girls from the University of Kansas who were planning a trip south of the border to a Mexican tourist town known as Matamoros. The two groups flirted a little before the girls invited Mark and his buddies to join them, They agreed on a time and meeting place and then went their separate ways. That evening, Matamoros was flooded with almost 15,000 spring breakers who piled into the many bars and cantinas of the town's main tourist strip, the Alvaro Obregón. And somehow, throughout the course of the evening, Mark's friends seemed to lose track of him in the throngs of drunken college kids. The last they saw of Mark was him talking to one of the Miss Tanline contestants on the steps of a house. But being the good friends that they were, none of them were in any rush to interrupt his attempted conquest, and each figured that they would just meet him back at the Sheraton back on South Padre. Mark eventually said goodbye to the Miss Tanline's contestant, but saw that his friends were nowhere to be found. As he wandered through the narrow streets and back alleys of Matamoros, inebriated and confused at the disappearance of his friends, it wasn't long before Mark found that he was completely lost. It seemed like the ultimate stroke of good luck when a red truck pulled up next to him as he walked, with the truck's two occupants asking if he needed a ride anywhere. Mark told them that he needed a ride back to the International Land Bridge, 
He had parked his car there, and it was his only way he knew of to reunite with his misplaced college buddies. Pretty much every Mexican that Mark had met during his time south of the border had been warm, friendly, and welcoming. Mark had no reason to suspect that these men were any different. But the next morning, Mark's friends discovered that he never made it back to the hotel that previous night, and what followed him climbing into that red truck is like something out of a horror movie. The driver and passenger of the red truck that offered Mark a ride were named Serafin Garcia and Malio Torres. Mark was obviously unfamiliar with the layout of the town of Matamoros, but he knew enough to know that the truck wasn't headed back towards the border. But when he confronted his new friends with this fact, they put a gun to his head and told Mark to shut his mouth lest a passive-aggressive complaint be his last words on this earth. At some point, Mark was handcuffed and transferred to a different vehicle. After that, he was driven through the back streets of the city and past an industrial area. The number of bars and vendor stands in the street began to thin out as they drove Kilroy through a highway on the city's outskirts. One of the last things Mark saw before he was blindfolded was that the truck he was being held prisoner in began to turn down a dirt road that ran between two dense cornfields. Robbed of his vision, Mark felt the truck come to a stop before he heard his kidnappers climb out and slam the doors. He expected that he too would soon be dragged from the truck, but no one returned. Mark was left handcuffed and blindfolded in the truck overnight, condemned to a cycle of terrified thoughts for seven straight hours. By the time the sun began to rise and the temperature inside the truck began to soar, he was dehydrated, starving, and scared out of his wits. Sometime that morning, Mark heard footsteps approaching the truck and felt his heart begin to race. But instead of the maltreatment he expected, the person who opened up the truck's rear door treated Mark with an unexpected kindness. He was fed fresh bread and given a glass of cool water to drink. But when he asked where he was in broken Spanish, the kind stranger remained silent. After he was fed, Mark heard another set of footsteps approaching the truck, a group of men this time. Only these people were not so kind. They wrapped duct tape around his head, completely covering his mouth, then did the same to his wrist after removing the handcuffs. When their prisoner was properly secured and silenced, the mysterious men frog-marched Mark through a field to some kind of storage shed where he was locked inside for the remainder of the day. That night, Mark heard a strange sound echoing around the fields outside of his makeshift jail cell. As the sounds drew closer, Mark began to realize what was happening. It was a chant, a long, slow droning from a large group that drifted ever gradually towards him. Still blindfolded and restrained, all Mark could do was listen as the large group of people opened up the door to the storage shed terrified at what they were about to do to him, and he was right to be terrified. A handful of the group stepped forward, and using machetes, cigarette lighters, and a variety of agricultural tools, they began to torture him. As he was being tortured, soundtracked by the sounds of his muffled screams, the men took turns in violating Mark as the straw below him soaked up his blood. When the men were finished torturing him, and the horrifying, unintelligible chanting of the crowd reached fever pitch. One of them brought a machete down hard against the back of Mark's neck, severing his spine and rendering him paralyzed. He was very well on the verge of death by that point, but the fact remains that Mark was still alive when one of them began to crack open his skull, scooping out his brains and placing them in a large metal pot known as a nanga. When they were cooked, each member of the unholy congregation ate a small piece of Mark's brain before they commenced yet more grisly work. After that, the congregation dug an unmarked grave, tossed Mark's remains into it, and covered them with earth. When Mark didn't show up at the hotel the next day, his friends began to worry and contacted the police to report him missing. Initially, South Padre law enforcement were reluctant to open a missing persons case as had been the case many times before, college kids were reported missing in Montemoros only for them to show up with a hangover and Apache memory with no hint of foul play. The police told Mark's friends that they'd do their best to find him, 
but what they didn't tell them was that Mark was just one of 60 people who had vanished from the streets of Matamoros over the last three months. It seems the police would have remained slow to act on the report if it wasn't for the fact that Mark's uncle was a high-ranking member of the United States Customs Service over in California. His intervention meant that a police task force was put together in Brownsville, Texas, whose sole purpose was to locate and potentially rescue their missing U.S. citizen. During the first days of their investigation into Mark's disappearance, both U.S. and Mexican authorities suspected foul play, but whether Mark had vanished as a result of drug-related violence or from a robbery gone wrong was an entirely different question. In a desperate radical bid to glean more information from Mark's friends, Texan law enforcement actually hired a hypnotist to see if they could access untapped, subconscious memories in each of the boys, and in one case, it actually worked. While under hypnosis, one of Mark's friends stated that he saw a young Hispanic man wearing a blue plaid shirt with a visible scar across his face talking to Mark. He recalled that the man walked up to Kilroy and told him, Hey, don't I know you from somewhere? It's shortly after this encounter that Mark was thought to have disappeared. This had investigators considering two possibilities. One, that Mark had been kidnapped for ransom, and two, that Mark had been stripped of all of his valuables, then executed. And seeing as there had been no ransom call, the cops began to fear the worst. Meanwhile, Mark's parents drove down to the Rio Grande Valley to aid in the search effort. They handed out around 20,000 informational leaflets throughout southeast Texas, and even offered a $15,000 reward to anyone who could help find their boy. Texan politicians also arranged a meeting between Mark's parents and the governor of Tamaulipas. Publicly, U.S. law enforcement praised the efforts of the Mexican federal police on the case, but privately they distrusted the state and municipal officials. They suspected that because state and local authorities were acting slow and not sharing enough information, Mark's murderers had inside men within the local government. On March 26, 1989, the case was featured on America's Most Wanted, generating nationwide attention. This added interest meant that more and more police resources were spent on the case, with Mexican authorities doing all they could to avoid an international incident. Less than a week later, Mexican police officers were stationed at a routine checkpoint near a place called Santa Elena. It had been a long and sweltering day, and mostly one without incident. But all of a sudden, a vehicle coming from the direction of the Texan border raced through the checkpoint without stopping. Instead of opting for a conventional, noisy pursuit, local police called in an unmarked cop car, tasking it with tailing the offending vehicle to gather intelligence. The undercover cops watched as their offender turned their vehicle down a dirt road that ran between two dense cornfields, but chose to remain at a distance and observe instead of making any kind of arrest. A short while later, the checkpoint dodger reappeared in their vehicle and drove off in the direction of Matamoros, giving the undercover officials a vital chance to perform an impromptu search of what appeared to be a run-down old ranch. What they found terrified them. In a filthy, crumbling old farmhouse, the undercover cops found evidence of rampant drug use, including traces of marijuana, peyote, and LSD. But they also found other things, small, strange-looking carvings of men and beasts, handmade wooden percussion instruments on which were carved the obscene images of ritual violence. They also found an animal horn that, for some reason, had been capped with a mirror, Inside an iron pot, the cops discovered would appear to be some kind of animal brain, chicken feet, a turtle, several herbs, a horseshoe, and coins mixed with animal blood. Neither of them could make sense of what they were seeing, but they knew something terrible was going on at that old ranch, and they suspected it might have something to do with the missing gringo that people kept talking about back at the precinct. The cops returned to the Santa Ella ranch a week later, only this time with serious reinforcement in tow. A team of heavily armed officers arrested a handful of the ranch residents on drug charges, but also knew the arrest would buy them time to search the place for any sign of their missing American college kid. One of the first people interviewed was the ranch's caretaker. Despite the circumstances, the caretaker seemed bizarrely relaxed, 
and was open and honest with cops when he was shown a photograph of Mark Kilroy. See, si, senor, he said. I saw him. Then went on to describe the small wooden shack Mark was being held in. Another of the arrested suspects stunned police when he openly admitted to his involvement in Mark's murder, saying he had been one of the men in the red truck who abducted him from Matamoros. When asked by police why he was being so honest with them, the man replied that the things they did on that ranch made them immune from law enforcement as well as giving them extra strength and virility. It was then that it all came out. Mark Kilroy had been murdered as part of some kind of occult ritual on the orders of a man named Adolfo Costanzo. Costanzo had ordered his followers to bring him a gringo to sacrifice and that doing so would bring them preternatural power. When the man then showed Mexican police officers where Mark was buried, they noticed that the grave was marked only by a small piece of wire that stuck out of the dirt. The man told them that this wire was attached to Kilroy's spinal cord so that they would be able to pull out the bones and wear them as necklaces after the body decomposed. Surrounding Mark's body was the corpses of 15 other people. It was a hellish scene, one of horror beyond description, but there were still so many unanswered questions. What was this ungodly, bloodthirsty cult that practiced human sacrifice, and who was its leader? In the course of their investigations, a joint task force of Mexican and U.S. lawmen discovered that Mark's murderer was none other than the leader of the cult, Adolfo Costanzo. 27-year-old Costanzo was actually an American citizen. Born in Miami in 1962, his father passed away when he was just a boy, and his wealthy stepfather died in mysterious circumstances, leaving behind a sizable inheritance. His mother then married a third time and, on that occasion, she became the wife of a man who was heavily involved in drug trafficking. But Adolfo's new stepfather had other, far more sinister interests too. He introduced young Adolfo and his mother to an ancient Afro-Caribbean religion known as Palo Mayambe, brought to the Americas by African slaves who partook in ritualistic animal sacrifice. The stepfather taught Adolfo a philosophy that he carried for the rest of his life. He told them that they should let non-believers take their own lives with narcotics and that they could get rich selling it to them. And so, Adolfo grew into his teenage years. He began training in the ways of Palo Mayambe. He started off as a palero, the name for a rank-and-file follower of the religion, but eventually graduated to the status of padrino a position equivalent to that of a high priest. Adolfo then took all that he had learned to Mexico City, which is where he developed a small following that grew into a powerful narcotics-funded cult. By all accounts, he was extremely charismatic, and the fact that he was formerly employed as a male model is a testament to his good looks. It was in Mexico City that Adolfo met the co-founder of the Santa Elena Death Cult, a Texan honors student and cheerleader by the name of Sarah Aldrete. Some of her former classmates found it suspicious that she drove a 1989 vehicle with an embedded telephone, while others recall she preferred to dress in black. But for the most part, students and teachers at her college in Brownsville recalled her as a friendly and hard-working student who showed no signs of abnormal behavior. Yet across the border in Montemoros, Sarah was involved in drug smuggling operations and in cult-like activities, using her beauty and charm to become the cult's primary recruiter. She recruited people by first showing them a 1987 movie called The Believers, which depicts a New York City-based cult that practiced human sacrifice for money and influence. Sarah forced prospective cult members to watch the movie over and over again in order to indoctrinate them to the necessity of human sacrifice. Investigators believe that her proximity to the U.S.-Mexico border allowed Aldrete to keep her two lives separate for years, to the extent that she showed signs of having a multiple personality disorder. Along with Adolfo Costanzo, Sarah had been orchestrating the kidnapping of young men from the streets of Matamoros for years, and sometimes personally luring them to their dooms herself. Two weeks after Mark's body was recovered from the Santa Elana Ranch, the Mexican Federal Police returned to burn down the shack he was held prisoner in. When there was nothing left of it but ash and smoke, 
a large wooden cross was placed over the ground on which it stood. A traditional Mexican folk healer known as a curandero then said a few prayers over the site, sprinkling salt and making the sign of the cross to purify the land. Many media outlets claim that the reasoning behind this was purely supernatural, but the real reason is that the police were trying to draw Adolfo Costanzo out of hiding, and burning down the shack would send him into a rage. After the flaming shack and purification ritual was shown on national television, it's said that Adolfo flew into a blind rage. In killing Mark Kilroy, he had prompted the destruction of the cult he had worked so hard to create, and the international attention that was garnered would mark the beginning of his downfall. The Mexico City Police Department noticed that Mark's murder was remarkably similar to murders carried out in Mexico City between 1987 and 1989, apparently having the same disturbing occultic hallmarks. Homicide detectives found themselves questioning a motley crew of local witchcraft practitioners and heard from a handful that Adolfo might well be hiding out in an area of Mexico City called Cuauhtémoc. Detectives cased the area and surrounded a house that they believed Adolfo was using as a hideout. Just as they were about to raid the premises, Adolfo Costanzo himself began to open fire on them from a window, spraying the street outside with submachine gun fire. After 45 minutes of panic, shooting at the police and burning US dollars on the home's kitchen stove, Adolfo decided to give up the fight, but he would not give himself up to the police. Instead, Adolfo ordered one of his followers to execute him. At first, the follower hesitated, refusing to kill their beloved leader. Everything is lost, Adolfo said to have screamed. If you allow those pigs to capture me, you'll burn in hell. Now do it. Shoot me. The follower gave Adolfo one last hug, ready to submachine gun, and then fired off a full magazine. Adolfo was dead before he hit the floor. The Santa Elena death cult died that day. The remaining members were rounded up, with some having once pledged their lives to Adolfo, denying knowledge of the cult altogether. But the judge and jury saw through their cowardly denials and each was condemned to prison with an average sentence of 50 years. Mark's parents would go on to found the Mark Kilroy Foundation, a campaign which promotes drug awareness. Besides counseling children and teenagers with drug advice, the foundation staff also advise young people who plan to travel for spring break, suggesting to stay in groups, keep an eye on each other and not wander off on their own. They also suggest tourists be aware of travel warnings and abide by foreign laws and regulations when they travel outside the U.S., though they reiterated that people can get hurt in the U.S. too. On the 20th anniversary of their son's murder, Jim and Helen Kilroy visited Rio Grande Valley in Montemoros to thank those who aided them in their search for their son. In a heartwarming address to the townsfolk, Jim stated he was overwhelmed by how supportive people have been and that it was easier to overcome their son's death because of the support they received. Helen added that she received a cross from a Brownsville woman when she was searching for her son in 1989. It's a reminder every time that I know that the Lord was involved in everything, she said, touching that same cross which hung around her neck. The strength that Helen shows in the face of something truly nightmarish is indisputably inspirational, and we can only hope that she her husband, and their beloved son can find the peace that they so richly deserve. Tammy Lynn Leppert was born February 5th, 1965 in Rockledge, Florida. One of five children, Tammy's parents divorced when she was just seven, and she was the only one still at home with their mother, Linda. She began participating in beauty contests at four years old, competing in nearly 300 beauty pageants and winning almost all of them. In her teenage years, Tammy was employed primarily as a model, appearing on the front of CoverGirl magazine in October 1978. But as she got older, Tammy began to land big parts in several movies, including Little Darlings, Spring Break, and even Al Pacino's Scarface. By 1983, she was set for major roles in three different movies, and critics were predicting that she would become one of the big stars of the 1980s. 
but in August of the previous year, after finishing up the production of a film called Spring Break, Tammy had attended a weekend rap party for the movie at an undisclosed location. A close friend of Tammy's, Wing Flanagan, says that after she returned from the party, Tammy seemed like a completely different person. She became intensely paranoid, refusing to leave her room or answer the door. She no longer ate food from open containers and often made Wing taste food before she ate it, fearing it had been poisoned. When Wing finally confronted her regarding her bizarre behavior, she responded with six terror-soaked words. Someone is trying to kill me. Then in March of 1983, whilst filming a shootout for Scarface, Tammy had a straight-up nervous breakdown on set after seeing some fake corn syrup blood. She was inconsolable, so much so that the movie's producers had to escort her from the premises so she could be properly calmed down. She ranted and raved about money laundering, how she was marked for assassination because she knew too much. Tammy later confided in a close friend that an associate of hers had bragged about a large money laundering and drug trading operation involving high-profile citizens in Brevard County, ranging from police officers to bankers and prominent locals. She also said that she had seen something horrible at the spring break wrap-up party, something that she wasn't supposed to see but refused to elaborate. Tammy's friend drove her over to the Brevard County Sheriff's Department so she could file a report. Yet when he was interviewed several years later, police officer Michael Wong said he couldn't recall many of the details regarding the meeting, just that Tammy was convinced that she was being targeted. A few months later, on July 1st, 1983, Tammy was standing outside her home when a gust of wind caught the open front door, slamming it shut. For some reason, this triggered an extreme fight-or-flight response in Tammy, who grabbed a baseball bat from the front yard and began smashing the small glass window on the front door. Screaming in panic, Tammy reached through the hole she'd smashed, unlocking the front door and hurtling back into the house, wailing as she went. She had to be pinned down and restrained by her roommate before she could do any additional damage. The following day, Tammy's deeply concerned roommate drove her over to the Brevard Mental Health Center for a three-day evaluation. Doctors observed that she was displaying some extremely erratic behavior, but Tammy's blood work showed that there were no drugs in her system. With no formal treatment plan laid out for her, Tammy was released on July 4th. Yet despite having time to calm down and collect herself, Tammy insisted that she was still in danger and made her roommate swear to avenge her should any harm come to her. A couple of days after the window-smashing incident, Tammy met up with an old high school friend by the name of Rick Adams. That night, she is said to have had some kind of emotional breakdown, bursting into tears and telling Rick that she had seen something she wasn't supposed to see at the spring break rap party and that someone was trying to silence her as a result. Rick pressed her for more details, but again she refused to give any, telling Rick that the less he knew, the safer he would be. The only thing that seemed to calm Tammy down was the offer of driving over to Rockledge's Evangel Temple Church so the pair could pray together. The experience had a profound effect on Tammy, bringing her a sense of peace that she hadn't felt in months. The pair planned to return to the church the following day, but when Rick dropped Tammy off back at her house, she gave him a rather cryptic message before she climbed out of the passenger seat. I just want you to know that I may have to go away for a while, but I also want you to know that I love you. When Rick called the next day to confirm their trip to the Evangel Temple, Tammy was already gone. Because at 11 a.m. on Wednesday, July 6th, Tammy's roommate heard a car horn beeping in the street outside their place. She peered out of her window and noticed that Tammy was climbing into the car of a man who turned out to be 22-year-old Keith Roberts. Keith was a young banker who had met Tammy in an acting class around three years prior. According to him, Tammy had called him earlier that morning and asked him to pick her up. As they drove around Cocoa Beach, Tammy told him she was desperately unhappy with her current living situation, how those close to her had attempted to have her committed to a mental hospital and that she was so scared she slept with a knife under her bed. Keith insists that it was during this drive that she expressed a desire to run away from home and asked him to drive her down to Fort Lauderdale after loaning her some money. 
Keith says he gave her $300, but refused to drive her the 170 miles down to Fort Lauderdale. His refusal upset Tammy, who began screaming, Let me out, let me out, stop, stop. Keith obliged and dropped her off on North Orlando Avenue at 1 p.m., about two blocks south of the now defunct Glass Bank. Sometime after being dropped off, Tammy used a payphone to call both her Aunt Ginger and a friend named Ron Abels, but neither picked up. Phone records show that she placed multiple calls to each person in a very short space of time, suggesting she was in something of a panic state. But what makes these calls particularly pertinent is that they were the final time Tammy Lynn would attempt to communicate with anyone before she dropped off the face of the earth. Five days later, with a heavy heart, Tammy's mother would report her missing to the Brevard County Sheriff. At first, Tammy's unhappiness at home meant that the police strongly suspected that she had simply run away. In 1992, Florida Today interviewed Tammy's mom, Linda, who told them that despite law enforcement insisting they were working on the case, very little progress had been made. All I hear is, we're working on it, we're working on it, but they can't tell me exactly what they've done, Linda said. It leads me to believe they've come up with their own scenario and they won't budge from it. The case became such a high-profile mystery that one of Florida's top private investigators offered to work the case for free. For the PI in question, a man named Mike Angeline, who was personal. They actually knew Tammy personally and he promised her mother that he'd do all he could to bring her home. Mike was shocked to find that out of all the key witnesses in Tammy's disappearance, only one single person had been interviewed. Not even Rick Adams, who had taken her to church the day before she vanished, had heard from investigating police. What's more, when Unsolved Mysteries featured the case on their show, Producer Matt Kleiman confirmed that the Cocoa Beach Police Department requested he not share information or leads with Tammy's mom, Linda. Matt was quick to add that this was the first time any police force had asked something like that of him. Why they would do something like that is a complete mystery, and in a case with so many unanswered questions, only one thing is clear, that Tammy Lynn Leppert was never seen again. It's entirely possible that Tammy really did just run away from home, opting to change her identity and live out the rest of her life anonymously. Yet all of her family and friends were insistent that if Tammy really did want to take off, she'd have at least talked to someone first, left a note or maybe some contact details. Rick Adams had mentioned her, I may have to go away for a while, comment to police, but was quick to clarify that this was in reference to her upcoming three-month stay in California while she looked for acting jobs there. To him, no matter how scared Tammy was, she would have talked to someone and the fact she just seemed to vanish had him fearing the worst. There have been many suspects in her disappearance, with some pretty wild speculation as to who might be to blame. One of the earliest suspects was a man by the name of Christopher Wilder, an Australian spree killer who murdered eight women between February and April of 1984. Wilder's bloodshed only ended when he took his own life in a New Hampshire motel and he became known as the Beauty Queen Killer due to his penchant for targeting aspiring glamour models. Police theorized that Tammy Lynn might well have been an early victim of Wilder's and her mother was so convinced of it that in May of 1984 she filed a million dollar lawsuit against him. Wilder's killing spree officially started just eight months after Tammy disappeared, and at least one victim of Wilder's was abducted in mere seven miles from where Tammy made her final phone calls to her aunt. Tammy's mother was also insistent that she recognized Wilder as a man who had visited her modeling agency several times in 1983, hoping to photograph Tammy. A judge later threw the lawsuit out of court, citing the lack of physical evidence, but Chris Wilder had always remained a potential suspect in the eyes of investigating homicide detectives. Another potential suspect in the case had earned himself the rather terrifying moniker of the vampire. John Crutchley lived just 30 miles south of Rockledge and was arrested in 1985 on some seriously heinous charges. According to his hitchhiker victim, John welcomed her into his car, drove her back to his home at gunpoint and held her captive. He repeatedly violated her while cutting her and collecting the blood that he spilled, which he then made a show of drinking. 
His victim eventually escaped from a bathroom window, alerting police who then took her to the hospital where doctors found that Crutchley had drank almost 50% of the blood in her body. Tammy Lynn was added to the list of the vampire's potential victims in 1988, but by 1995, the Brevard County Sheriff's Office was no longer actively pursuing him as a suspect. The final solid suspect is obviously the last person to see her alive, 22-year-old banker Keith Roberts. But bizarrely, law enforcement didn't get in contact with Keith until years after the event, and by 1990, had only a few brief phone calls with detectives regarding Tammy's disappearance. Detectives also noted that Keith appeared to be ducking any kind of face-to-face -face meeting and knew much more than he was comfortable sharing. Another interesting question relates to Tammy's state of mind in the days leading up to her disappearance. As we've mentioned, Tammy returned from the rap party of a film called Spring Break, fearing for her life. She mentioned money laundering, having seen something she shouldn't have, and that she was being targeted for assassination as well. But were these fears actually based in reality, or was Tammy suffering from some kind of paranoia? Police found no evidence of large-scale money laundering among any of the film's acting or production staff, but bear in mind that these were the same officers that had already displayed gross negligence in their investigation, to the point that Tammy's mother hinted at a cover-up in a radio interview in 1993, when she publicly named a specific detective who she believed knew Tammy's killer's identity. In 37 years, Tammy's older sister had never given up hope of finding her sister. Susan Leopard frequently posts about her sister on social media, hoping that the information-rich digital age we now live in can help her dig up clues from the past. She doesn't believe that Chris Wilder or the vampire John Crutchley killed Tammy, but has often stated that she believes her sister's disappearance may be connected to the death of Nancy K. Brown, a 25-year-old tourist from Illinois whose remains were later found in a wooded area near Cocoa Beach in March of 1984. Both Nancy and Tammy were young, petite, had light hair and eyes, were last seen on the same street, and vanished exactly one month apart. Nancy's murder has never been solved, but there's every chance that the culprit is also responsible for Tammy Lynn's disappearance too. But for now, the truth behind Tammy's murder and the vast conspiracy that is supposedly behind it will remain a mystery, and the person responsible for her fate is free to walk among us. A couple of years back, me and a few of my sorority sisters were driving down to Miami Beach for spring break. It's like a 10 hour drive down from North Carolina, so we decided to stop over for an hour or two in Savannah to grab a bite to eat before driving the rest of the way. It meant we wouldn't be rolling into Miami until late at night, but we knew each other a lot better than to attempt a road trip whilst hangry. So right after we passed Jacksonville, we end up taking a wrong turn, and we decide to turn around to get back on the highway using a bunch of smaller roads. It's pitched black. Every other street light is broken or flickering, just not the kind of place that a car full of college girls wants to be at that time of night. And to make matters worse, we're all stressing out, using a bunch of different sat-nav apps on our phones to try to find the right way back to the highway. I'm not even sure how it happened, but I'm in the back seat and all I hear is like, Sarah, look out! Sarah slams in the brake and we all see why she did so. Looking out into the road in front of us to see this guy just standing there, staring into the car's high beams. He obviously couldn't see who was in the car, like he had to have been blinded by Sarah's headlights, but what was so creepy is that he was staring at the windshield like he could really see us, and he did not look happy. The guy has all this camouflage clothing on, but not like military camo, like the sticks and leaves patterns that you see hunters using. He had this real thick salt and pepper facial hair too, so bushy you could barely make out his features with these long strands of greasy gray hair coming over his shoulders. I think if it was anyone else, Sarah would have honked her horn and shouted a few obscenities, but the guy in front of us that night honestly looked incredibly creepy, and considering what he did next, I know we were right not to antagonize him. We're so distracted by this guy that no one notices what's at his feet. 
then all of a sudden he slowly kneels down and picks something up off the road. And then when he stands up, the headlights are shining on what he picked up, and we all just gasp in horror. It was like this pear-shaped, flattened mass of blood, guts, and fur. It was so messed up that it actually took me a second to work out that it was a raccoon, and the guy was holding it by what was left of its tail. This guy was out there, in the middle of the night, with no flashlight or nothing, picking up roadkill, for God knows what reason. One of the girls starts saying, Go around, Sarah, go around him! Sarah just goes into full-on action movie mode. She reverses, revs her engine a little, then powers around the guy in a wide arc before speeding off down the road. That was most definitely the freakiest thing I'd ever seen. Thankfully, it didn't ruin our spring break. We were definitely shaken up, but obviously no one was hurt. I guess I have my own little Florida man story now, but I feel like that's too light-hearted of a way of explaining it whitewashing what could have been a pretty horrific situation. That guy collecting, or eating, or maybe doing something even worse with the bodies of roadkill animals. God only knows what he'd have done if he got his hands on a car full of college girls. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join a live stream to catch an invite to my discord and if you want to support me even more grab early access to all future narrations for just one dollar a month on patreon and maybe even pick up some let's read merch on spreadshirt and check out the let's read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts links down below Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.